welcome to our broadcast for today. Before we get into our scripture, I um, wanted to mention that uh, we're doing th something a little bit differently uh, with this one. Typically, what what's happened since we started meeting for worship in our parking lot uh, a few weeks ago is uh, that for those who are not able to come to the to the parking lot. Uh, we have broadcast the same message as is, is, you know, is given in the parking lot worship. And that's not the case today. This is actually a different message than is being spoken at uh, the parking lot service. Uh, the one at the parking lot um, just didn't fit as well, I thought, in this kind of medium and broadcast. Uh, so what I'm doing here is finishing out our series of studies in the book of Nehemiah as our Sunday lesson. Again, uh, you may not have been watching the Nehemiah broadcast. Hope this will encourage you maybe to go back and do that if you haven't. Um, but I also told the people at the parking lot service that, um, that the, the video broadcast for today was the Nehemiah study so that they'll look at that as well. So doing a couple of different things today, and I uh, hope this has been a good uh, good study for you. Um, as we talked about this theme of let us rise up and build, this is actually the 13th lesson in the series. Um, Nehemiah has 13 chapters, there are 13 lessons um, in this series, and we've looked at it in terms of what what we can learn about building or rebuilding things um, from this great character Nehemiah. So that's what we're finishing up today and uh, we'll continue to make videos and broadcasts as we go along. Uh, we'll be starting a different study um, next time but uh, just keep those things in mind. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for the day Thank you that we can worship you wherever we are, that we can think about spiritual things, we can get into your word and study it and be encouraged and built up. Thank you for your Son, our Savior Jesus, and we thank you for those down through time who have lived faithful to him, uh, people even in ancient times like Nehemiah. Help us to see today how he was like Jesus our Savior. Thank you for the forgiveness we have in Christ. Pray you'll be with our world right now as it struggles through difficult times and may we be a part of, of healing and bringing people together. Thank you for your uh, attention to us and, and every blessing. We praise you and give you this time. We come to you in the blood and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you're one of those people who, um, you know, for whom every single story just has to have a happy ending, the Bible just might be a pretty frustrating read at times. Now, it's true that the Bible ultimately has a happy ending with you know, the redeemed of all ages gathered into the new heavens and the new earth uh, to, to be with the Lord forever and ever. But along the way, there are many sad endings, and there are frustrated purposes, and there are failed efforts. And that is just life, real life, in a fallen world and with fallen people. Eventually, as hard as we might try to avoid it, we all return to reality, to realville, as I'm calling it today. Uh, we're not allowed to, to live all our time up on the mountaintop. We have to return to the valley where real life is lived. Uh, even Jesus' disciples couldn't stay up on the mountain uh, with him if you remember that story of his transfiguration, uh, even after that great event, he led them down 
into the valley and the first thing they had to deal with was a failure. Matthew chapter 17. So even in scripture, Realville exists. Fantasy land does not. Um, the first couple sins and they get tossed out of paradise. Noah gets drunk and messes up his family. Abraham becomes a liar. David, the great David, the man after God's own heart, commits adultery and he murders a man to cover it up. Peter denies even, even knowing Jesus. And so we could go on and on about reality in the Word of God. A lot of people, I imagine, would like the book of Nehemiah to end at chapter 12. That would be a happy ending at the end of chapter 12. Uh, last time we, we shared uh, the great celebration in Jerusalem as they dedicated the freshly built walls to God and as they marched around the city uh, on top of the walls, you remember, and, and as they went they were, they were singing their songs and they were praising their God. It would seem appropriate and Hollywood would certainly let the credits roll there and uh, let us close the story with a smile on our faces and a warm feeling in our breast, you know, as we drive home from the theater. But then comes chapter 13. Chapter 12 doesn't end Nehemiah. Nehemiah has 13 chapters, as we mentioned already. And so it's real. It's real hill. Nehemiah, after completing this wall rebuild and, and experiencing that dedicatory celebration, he goes back to his old job. You remember where the book began? Remember that Nehemiah was a government official. He was a servant of the king of Persia. And he goes back for some period of time. We don't know how long. Um, it could have been a year or two, um, maybe even several more. But he goes back to Persia. He leaves Jerusalem behind. And you know his work there is done, seemingly. And he tells about this in verse 6 of chapter 13. I'm going to make reference to several verses in chapter 13 by just citing the verse number and not necessarily reading all these verses. Um, so if you're following along, you might want to look as we mention these. But he mentions uh, this reality in, in verse 6 of chapter 13. And, you know, as we look at it and reflect on it, wouldn't it be great if everything had stayed the way it was when he left, um, when they finished the walls, wouldn't it have been great if the people had kept the promises and the commitments that they had made? But again, this is reality. This is not fantasy land. Uh, one student, in sort of summing up the book of Nehemiah, said that you could really divide the book into two parts. Just a little review here. Part one would be the people rebuilding the walls. That's chapters one through six. And then part two, God rebuilds the people in, in uh, chapter seven through 13. And in that second part of the book, as God works through Nehemiah to rebuild the people, uh, Let's recall some of the things that were done. In chapter 7, they had their identity as a people rehearsed and reestablished as they list their genealogy. So you have a long list of names and so forth in chapter 7. In chapter 8, they read the Bible. They, they read the Word of God and they're convicted by it of their sins. In chapter 9, they confess their sins and repent of their sins. And then in chapter 10, the people make three deeply felt and fully serious promises. Uh, and, and in general, they say, 
we will keep God's word. Um, but specifically, they say, number one, we're going to take our marriages seriously. We're going to make them holy and devoted to God. That's promise number one. Number two, they promise to keep the Sabbath day as a holy day, as, as it was commanded in the law of Moses. That's the second promise. And then number three, they promise, in essence, to worship in spirit and truth. Uh, to borrow a phrase from the New Testament, they say that they will make sure that the temple worship is right and it is a clear priority among them. So they make those three promises. The unhappy ending of the book is that by chapter 13, they have completely broken all three promises. And overall, they're just ignoring the word of God. And all this takes place while Nehemiah is back in Persia. So you can imagine the old man thinking, I turn my back for one minute and look what you do. Um, you ever have that feeling? You know, I take one day off and, and this mess is what I have to come back to. Yes, that's what life is like in Realville. Uh, Moses knew what that was like. Remember Moses? He, he goes up on Mount Sinai to meet the one true God. And when he comes back down, Israel is dancing before idols. Uh, Jesus knew this reality. He goes into the garden to pray and, and, and to pray to that same God. And he comes back to find that the disciples sleep. It's real life in a fallen world. So Nehemiah asks again for leave from his day job and returns to Jerusalem. And you can imagine that, that he was not happy. Um, in verse 11 of chapter 13, he confronts the officials of the city of Jerusalem, rebukes them. In verse 17, he confronts the nobles of Judah and rebukes them. And then in verse 25, he confronts the parents of Israel and rebukes the parents and, uh, you know, in chapter 13 of Nehemiah, there is just a whole lot of confronting and rebuking going on. And there's one thing that spurs all this confronting and rebuking that's going on. One thing that sets it in motion and gets it moving. And it's in the opening words of the chapter. Verse 1 says this, On that day... They read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Uh, we know those words, don't we, from 2 Timothy 3.16. And we like that sentiment. Uh, we believe those words. But sometimes you see those words come at us. Uh, we are the ones that need taught. We are the ones who need trained. Sometimes we're the ones who need corrected and rebuked, just like Israel did on this occasion. The question is, how do we respond when God's word is applied to us? Well, Nehemiah turned the word of God toward the citizens of Jerusalem and Judah because they had broken these three promises and commitments that they had made. Uh, they weren't taking care of the temple. They weren't uh, tending to the worship of God as they had promised. In fact, they were actually neglecting the, to support the Levites. Uh, the Levites were the ones working up in the temple they were supposed to lead the, the temple worship, and so the Levites uh, were, were going unsupported. They were having to leave their God-given roles and jobs to go farm outside the city so they could feed their families. There was, in actuality, probably very little worship going on at the temple at all. 
And one of the reasons for this was a name from earlier in the book, Tobiah. One of the bad guys from early in the story of Nehemiah. Tobiah is back and he has wormed his way into Jerusalem again and actually he's been given a large warehouse in the temple for his own house. And you know that was actually space that was supposed to house food for the Levites and, and other important worship materials. And now Tobiah is living there. It's really hard to believe that that happened, uh, but it did. Again, Realville. So Nehemiah returns and throws all of Tobiah's stuff and Tobiah himself out of the temple. I doubt that he did so gently. In fact, I imagine that, that Nehemiah cleansed the temple that day with force similar to how Jesus would do it about four centuries later. Another promise that the people had forgotten was to keep the Sabbath day holy. They were actually treating the sacred time of the Sabbath as badly as they were treating the sacred space of the temple. It was business as usual on Sabbath day. You see, Sabbath was a day for them to trust God. It was a day that was supposed to be devoted to God, a day of worship and study, not a day of business, not a day of work. And and they have forgotten that. Nehemiah, of course, rebukes them very strongly. In part, he does it by reminding them that it was this very kind of thing, this very sin that had led to the exile of their forefathers in the first place. You can see that rebuke down in verse 18 of chapter 13. So Nehemiah shuts the gates of the city on Sabbath day. And he sets guards at those gates. And he makes sure that the people give that day to God like they had been commanded to do and like they had promised to do. And then finally the people had violated their promises about marriage and family. It says this in verses 23 and 24. In those days, Nehemiah says, In those days I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but the language of each people. Now, this is not about racial purity. This is about devotion to God. They were intermarrying with unrepentant idolaters. And what do you think it was that, that they were learning from them? Idolatry. And they're not even teaching their children the language of Israel anymore. And so how would they ever learn the scriptures, you see? Nehemiah actually violently confronts and rebukes this broken promise in the following verses, and, and he makes them promise to change their practices and to do better in the future. And, you know, lest we think this is just a history lesson, and this is all about them and, and limited to their day, I I remind us that, that we live in Realville too. We need to be careful to keep our promises as well. How about our promises to, to uh, maintain temple worship? You, you might say, well, we don't have a temple 
to maintain today. Oh? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that is within you? You see, we're all little temples of God walking around housing the Holy Spirit if indeed we have the Holy Spirit within. And so the question is, have we let anyone or anything else move into that worship space that's supposed to be reserved for holy things? Now, this doesn't mean that we're all these independent worship enterprises, each off doing our own thing, because the scripture also says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So there is a corporate aspect to worship, and we don't want to neglect that. Do we trust God? Now, Israel struggled to trust God by not working on Sabbath, not working on Saturday. Now, we don't uh, observe Saturday in that way, but it's true that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Uh, we hear that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. We still are called to trust God and to devote focused time to Him throughout our daily lives. How are we doing giving God some of our time? Do we trust Him? And then marriage and family. Um, do I even need to say it? It sort of preaches itself, doesn't it? The law of Christ instructs us to not allow ourselves to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, this is not about race or prejudice or hatred. This is about having marriages that are united to glorify the one true God. It's about raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and teaching them the word of God as a parenting couple. You know, family remains the backbone of the, ch of, the, of the kingdom of God just as it was supposed to be in Israel. How are we keeping our promises, Israel? Are we keeping the word of God in these things and others? You know, there is really so much here in this closing chapter. Um, the, the book closes with a statement from Nehemiah. Uh, this, this man that I hope we've grown to appreciate and love and admire uh, because of his words and his actions sort of reminded me of uh, Julius Caesar's famous line. You remember that from history? Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered. But for, for Nehemiah, he says it this way, I cleansed, I established, I provided. Verses 30 and 31 of Nehemiah 13. I cleansed, I established, I provided. He, he did what had to be done to set things right in Realville. This man who in, in many ways should remind us of our Lord and Savior. Have you ever thought about it? Uh, really before I did this study I never had the great parallel between Nehemiah and the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it for just a moment as we close. Both of them cleansed the temple both of them wept over the state of Jerusalem. Both led people to build. They could both be seen to be saying, let us rise up and build. Both of them were greatly harassed and oppressed by enemies and plotted against by enemies. 
So there are just so many things that we're reminded of concerning our Lord. Well, Nehemiah closes the book with a prayer. It should not be surprising. Prayer has been an emphasis throughout the story of Nehemiah. He says in prayer, Remember me, O my God, for good. I don't think that is a selfish prayer at all. Ask yourself, how do I want to be remembered? For good or evil? As a, as a builder or a breaker? As a lover or a fighter? As faithful or unfaithful? And then, even more importantly, by whom do I want to be remembered? And Nehemiah wanted to be remembered for good by God. Can we say the same today? Do we want God to remember us for good? I'd say if we can't pray that prayer, then, then there's something wrong that needs to be made right. And so, a return to Realville and um, an interesting way to close the story of Nehemiah. Again, I encourage you to, to, to read and study this book and reflect on the great lessons that are there to, to be learned and, and lived out as we, in our lives and in the life of the church, try to rise up and build. Thank you for being a part of these studies. May God add his blessings to um, what we have looked at.